So hi everyone, uh, my name is Mikos Stocco, I'm the Museum of London Archaeological Archive Assistant and today I'm going to talk about a new approach to Russian invasive archaeological shelves. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, then I'm going to talk about the actual project, <coughs> protocol and project. So if you don't know us, we are the largest archaeological archive in the world, we are in the Guinness World Record for that. And that means that we got about 9,000 archives in our store. We got 11 kilometers of shelves and we got over 100,000 boxes of material. And that is basically what we knew in 2016. In 2017, uh, I was hired to do the uh, Islamic England Rationalization Project. And when I started, pretty much the archive looked like that which might not look that bad, but you can see having an, an archive that got over uh, 9,000 uh, archives, we do have a lot of space that is just wasted because of different size of boxes. Uh, a lot of labels are really bad. Uh, we, don't got, we don't have enough information in there. A lot got lost and inside the boxes, not always, but sometimes it's just a mess. Um, and it doesn't respect our own standards. So that is not um, ideal and having about 400 sites going on every year in London um, being the archive felt pretty much like that <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2017 we started to do this project for Historic England where we're looking at this selected material and uh, possibly we're looking at discarding stuff you can read the results and everything we've done on the SMA uh, website. But just to give you a little bit of um, an idea of what the statistics were, we've got over a thousand sites that got only one box. And I can say that that box most of the time is not full. Uh, only 31 sites produce more than 500 boxes each. And not surprised, most of the archive is pottery, followed by animal bones and then building materials. We also looked at the quality of records and we identify some patterns on that. So we all know now that rationalizing, rationalizing is going to be expensive, time consuming. It's not the answer, it's not definitive, uh, but we are part of a museum and what the museum was asking me is to justify and demonstrate why we had to keep all that material and it can be hard to answer that question, especially when you don't actually know why you have this and that and that. Um, and we don't know this material. We know that shelves, it's fine, um, but we don't know anything else about that. We cannot justify and say, oh yeah, they got great potential. And then they ask me, okay, who is studying them? I've got no one in the last 75 years. Um, so at that point, at least in my head, rationalizing stopped being synonymous of discarding and started to be the synonymous of research for value and research for research, uh, for potential. Uh, so I start asking the archive question like, okay, what is the archaeological value of this material? Um, what potential for research does it have? And how, what do you need to know to promote this material to the public and to the academics? So obviously we started looking at shelves and we only got, only got 898 boxes of shelves in the archive, which covered just 2% of our archive. But that was an easy win, uh, or at least that was how, what I was taught. And I started to look into it and I started talking to experts, societies, historic England, and all a bunch of people I started to read a lot about them. And I found out that they are actually a lot cooler than they look like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in August, I teamed up with a, um, a PhD student from Sheffield University called Angela Macarinelli, and we created a protocol, uh, which is divided in two parts. The first one looked at the uh, records, so from very basic things like site codes to do we have a report, do we have a share report, and that kind of things. So this was mainly what I did. And then what she did is actually looking at the shelves. So we identified the five most common shelves in uh, London. And then we looked at oyster shelves because they, call, they are the, the biggest assemblage we got in the archive. And we looked at the 
right, left and right valve, we looked at which one were measurable and unmeasurable, uh, preservation, completeness, epipions, and the visual characteristics. Um, so that sounds like working. Uh, and this is how far B or the protocol looks like. So looking, doing this kind of uh, research, um, Angela did in about three weeks, two sites, Trick Lane and Milk Street. Um, she pretty much had to work one hour for each box and just re uh, uh, rebagging and reorganizing the uh, material inside the boxes. We actually save time boxes, which is already rationalizing. Um, but also now, with what she did, we are able to identify which contexts and assemblages do have potential for research mm -hmm. and which uh, contexts and assemblages we can actually propose to academics, researchers, and all the people. And by consequence, we are also um, able to see which contexts are not of any good, really. Uh, that we can only count how many fragments we got and nothing else. So potentially we can discard those. But that's not necessarily the point. I think the point is that having this kind of um, protocol, which is pretty easy, allows you to do things like DNA uh, analysis, or at least to see which assemblages is good for that. And uh, you can do with shells DNA analysis, you can do uh, analysis on protein, you can do analysis on uh, um, Beyond, you can reconstruct the marine environment they were living in. Uh, you can reconstruct how the pollution went over the years in that part of England, which is absolutely great. Um, and finally, at some point, I will be able to go out and promote what is archaeology, what is our, um, our material and our uh, collection, things that until now we don't really know, uh, or we didn't know. And we can finally disseminate the message and I can actually stand up in, uh, in the museum and say, yes, we do need to keep this material because what, this is what we can do. And until this moment, we just didn't have the chance to do it. So that's pretty much um, where we are at the moment. We are going to try this um, protocol in January with a, a volunteer project. So it's thought to be easy enough for trained volunteers to do it. And that's gonna cut the cost, obviously. Behind us, we do have uh, macologists that are working with us. So we obviously got experts. Um, I received training. Angela is gonna be working on that with us as well. So it's just a process that is, it's just an easy start, but potentially we can do a lot with that and actually change things. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>